if I'm in a field where I'm questioning it, I want to question the foundation of the field of AI, right? I don't even want to make start with the assumption that certain type of technologies need to exist. I need to be able to say, maybe this thing should not exist. Uh, Tim Neat, uh, to, to get into your experience as well, uh, very curious about uh, like your research, uh, what you're working on right now, uh, like and and ultimately like th there's a big high profile story, sad uh, sad to say about how uh, the research and things that you were coming to bear at, like in, in the uh, stochastic, stochastic paper, appearance paper, uh, these are uh, observations uh, on the ethical limitations of, of language systems. There's, there's observations about these things and suggestions on how to, to better approaches. And I, I just personally think that being fired for uh, expressing those views was absolutely wrong. Uh, so could you, could, could you talk about, um, the the background there in that research and then ultimately I, uh, uh, like how that led to the founding of dare uh, distributed ai research institute yeah sure so um like i said you know going back to let's say 2016 i was you know i was doing all i was an analog circuit designer before that you know i was working at apple and then i went back to my phd and i was doing computer vision stuff then i started you know veering off into this space and when i did I started with a number of things. So the first one was worked on a paper with Joy Bulamini uh, showing the, um, and this was part of her master's uh, thesis, basically showing the disparities and error rates um, among, you know, when you look at APIs that um, had facial automated facial analysis services tools, right? That were actually on the market from Microsoft, from Face++, from um, IBM. And we showed that, um, they were much less accurate for darker skinned women than they were for, for example, for lighter skinned men. Um, and so when you combine that with, you know, who is over policed, um, et cetera, then it ends up that there are a lot more, we, we actually said that we expect that this kind of stuff would result in wrongful arrests of mostly black people, right? And so Harry Johnson at Wired has a great article, a profile of these three black men who were wrongfully arrested because they were misidentified by an automated facial analysis tool. And, you know, they weren't sentenced, but you see that their lives were turned upside down because of that. And and for what? It was for, you know, you know, for um being suspected of stealing something small or whatever, which then goes to the larger question of what exactly is our society trying to do right over police and over punish rather than thinking about what how can we actually nurture people and what is it that we can do for people so um it started there and then i worked on documentation practices and i was like hey like you know given my engineering background we used to have lots of documentation we need that kind of stuff here you know so that's what i was working on and then you know worked on black and ai because we're like oh we don't have representation we need to have enough representation so when i was working at google this was you know kind of the path that i was going down and so we um around 2020 uh which uh, June, basically, where uh, May, June, where the George Floyd was murdered and there were worldwide protests. Um, I, you know, I remember there was an email thread uh, among the researchers on a large language model that was produced by OpenAI called GPT-3. And everybody was just super excited by it. They're like, oh my God, this is so good. This is, and I was like, and also like check, you know, Anima Anand Kumar at that time was talking about how there was such racist and sexist outputs. And she was even saying, how could you release this during this time when people are having protests, et cetera. You know, people weren't super interested. And so then I, 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 I you know, send a message to my collaborator, Emily Bender, and I'm like, what can we, do you have any papers that you know of that talk about the dangers and ethical concerns of large language models? Because these people are just talking about, you know, wanting to build bigger ones. They want to be the leaders. Everybody seems to be racing. Um, and she was like, oh, I don't see any paper. I don't have one, but let's write one. So this is how the whole thing happened. And so um, I was basically concerned about this attitude that, um, all of these companies and now it's actually gotten a lot worse which is sad so i was worried about 
text to text to text models, models that input text and output text. And these are used in chatbots and search, you know, ranking search queries and auto completion and machine translation. So we outlined a number of our concerns with these kinds of models being deployed and using ingesting kind of all this text on the internet with the assumption that this is a, a representation of humanity, right? And we know that's not true, right? Not only who has internet versus who doesn't, but also, you know, whose views are represented on the internet, especially those of us who get harassed all the time. We know this is not true. So that was just one of our concerns. So we outlined these concerns. Of course, we know the end of the story. I got fired. Um, it was a peer review paper. I was asked to retract um, it or remove um, the names of the Google um, um, authors, etc. So what what that experience taught me is that all of the stuff I did before that was with the assumption that, you know, even though I pushed against in institutional incentive structures, it, it, it has to have the the, the institutional incentive structures have to align in order for my work to be impactful. So that means that, for example, if I say you should have better documentation practices, I'm literally saying that instead of making $100 on this product, <laughs> you should make like $5 on it because you should work much slower. You should have a lot more resources dedicated to testing and safety and this and that. Um, you should probably not build it. And how is that going to happen if, you know, in this in this kind of incentive structure where you're maximizing profit? So it's just not going to happen, right? So we either need regulation or something, something that, you know, levels the playing field for everybody. So that's how I was like, okay, you know, if I start my own, and in academia, it, it was a similar thing, right? People want to publish a lot of papers. If I'm in a field where I'm questioning it, I want to question the foundation of the field of AI, right? I don't even want to make start with the assumption that certain type of technologies need to exist. I need to be able to say, maybe this thing should not exist. How can I say that if I'm in a department that is predicated on something? What if I, you know, if I'm in a computer vision department to get tenure, I have to appeal to all the people who've been in this department forever, right? I'm not going to get tenure by saying maybe this field is fundamentally flawed and should not exist. <laughs> I can't say that. So at DARE, we have the I would say we have the freedom to say that, right? And so the goal is to, you know, not limit ourselves um, into the assumption that a specific type of um, technology or framework has to exist, but start with the people, right? So if we see harms, we want to, we want to, you know, raise, ring the alarm on those harms. And then if we think that there are places where these tools could be beneficial to us, we want to start with people at the margins, right? And so that, that's why we also have, you know, refugee advocates, labor organizers, et cetera, in our team. It's not just, you know, researchers, um, interdisciplinary um, team of PhDs, et cetera. So to me, that's, that's really the goal of DARE, is to be able to not be encumbered by the assumption that anything, so we say AI is not inevitable, right? That anything really needs to exist, right? Um, if, you know, some things, you just probably shouldn't uh, use AI, you, you probably shouldn't gather data on people or anything like that. So it's not the assumption is not that this thing has to exist and how can we retrofit it? It's more like, okay, um, what should we build instead if we want to build anything instead? So th that's a, a wonderful background to come from and it addresses like a really, really painfully obvious point, which is if uh, we're asking the same people who are making the systems to uh, self-govern, then there is a major conflict of interest there.